It's kind of a wiggle. Um, the words uh, I want to start off with uh, just kind of welp- welcoming um, all my brothers and sisters, uh, those of you who are away from your loved ones, as we begin and, and gather and start putting our minds to one place. These conversations are, are difficult and sometimes in, in some places, um, especially when we're talking about in, indigenous people and indigenous rights, because we have to examine our, our social political history here in Canada. And that's a hard conversation for many people to take if you haven't explored that, simply because it's a shameful, ugly, disgusting history. And many Canadians actually believe it didn't happen. They believe racism doesn't exist here. And we have to really dive into understanding that because what it is about for Indigenous peoples to stand up and recognize their original instructions, where they come from. So, uh, can somebody bring up my PowerPoint here for me? Not that I'm really tied to it, I actually hate PowerPoint, but... (laughs) Um, So, I'm in a bit of a challenging situation for for many realities, and, and one is that I'm very junior in my academic career, but this is my ninth career. (laughs) Uh, I've been doing a lot of work uh, for my nation, for different nations across Turtle Island for over 30 years. And as was mentioned in the early introduction, uh, we're coming at this work from psychology. And community psychology, although is not well known in Canada, is well known internationally. And as a subdiscipline of psychology, what we're really interested in exploring about the concepts of well-being of a collective, of a community. And what we do, again, tries to examine all the different pieces of community and all the intricacies and relationships within community. And that includes legislation, social policy, law, organizational structures, right down to the families and individuals. So it's a really unique discipline and and when I found it, um, it was interesting because I encountered these uh, uh, scholars of community psychology and they were saying, oh yeah, this is pretty new, pretty innovative thinking. Started in 1968, this big famous conference where they start looking at what about community? What about the whole? What about relational and collective well-being? And I start laughing at them and I said, well, that's not new. <laughs> that's ancient, that indigenous people around the world have understood health and well-being in those terms since the beginning of time. So I decided to start playing with them. And I finished my master's and was, started the PhD program And what's so cool about this discipline is it allows my indigenous thought to come into it and not have so much conflict. I mean, there's still quite a bit, but, you know, it allows me to express my indigeneity and my indigenous thinking in a manner that fits well within the discipline. The other challenge I have and through interculturality is I'm Hutasoni. I'm researching with Anishinaabe people. And we haven't always got along. (laughs) Right? And so learning from them and from the elders and, and reading their stories and learning about their relationships to land has been a phenomenal opportunity for me. So this concept of Minobamatsuin is a powerful understanding. Well, we first have to state that when we're talking about these indigenous laws, that these ways of knowing that these are inherent rights. 
the mere fact that these indigenous people are, are born into collective nations, extends to them rights given to them from the creator. That no nation state, no law, legislation, nothing can take away from that reality. And a lot of my work in coming into this understanding is again, because I've been working on behalf of my community, the Haudenosaunee, in the Hunting and, and Wildlife Committee. And a lot of, again, if you're not familiar with Haudenosaunee history in Canada and North America, we've got a long history of being a major pain in the butt to the Canadian state because of that level of resistance, because of always fighting and asserting our rights because we exist as a sovereign nation. We haven't signed one single treaty with the government of Canada. Our treaties are with the British Crown, the Netherlands Crown, and the French Crown. And so we still exercise and assert that sovereignty. Even though we have an imposed legislation of the Indian Act, we still fight and resist that. And we still have our traditional government. It's fractured absolutely fractured and it's not functioning nowhere near in which it's supposed to be. But that's a level of resistance that we continue to assert. And that's a lot of the work that I've been doing and bringing that mindset into our research. So I met Dr. Terry Mitchell when I started working at Laurier and uh, her and Jose Alwyn started this nice big fancy organization, Pan American Indigenous Rights and Resource Governance Network, right? And we're, you know, as was mentioned, we're looking at the implementation of FPIC through North and South America. And so my doctoral work has been based in, in Matawa, uh, Ring of Fire in Northern Ontario. And we selected this site several years ago because it's an interesting and emblematic case because it's pre-development, right? There's nothing been signed yet in this area, but it has a huge potential impact, both for Canada and Ontario, but especially for the Matawa communities. There's nine communities that, that live in this region that operate under Matawa tribal uh, authority. And, it sits there with a deposit, an estimated deposit of $65 billion of chromite. When you're talking about all the subsidiary developments and, and building of the road or rail to get that out of this fly-in area, it's in excess of $200 billion. So the government and the Crown is certainly asserting its demand and need for this, for economic development in the country. But in amongst all these uh, uh, areas are the communities. And it's a mixture of uh, Ojibwe and Cree communities who, you know, through the years and generations have split off and, and have really uh, developed an Oji Cree culture there. But they really follow, again, the grandfather teachings and this understanding of Mino Bamatsuen, that there is a way to live a perfect life in relationship to the community or to the universe you know this exists with every indigenous nation right and we can refer to this as our original instructions that every nation was given some way manifest to how to live and exist in this world it's how we constructed our civilizations it's how we come to know and understand how we live in this world. Now certainly, as I mentioned, I'm more familiar with Ganesh Ragoa, the great law, right? And the grandfather teachings, you can see, they parallel. The words might be a little different, but the concepts and philosophies that are behind these words are very similar. And as far as that goes, if we extend that to indigenous people globally, they're pretty identical, right? and the concepts and how we get to this place. So 
just to mention, I'm Huta Sony. We don't recognize agendas or timekeeping. <laughs> Our ceremonies go on for days. <laughs> Teasing, I'll try to be good. But it's about living in relationship with all things, right? And that's a very active relationship. And in the case of Matawa, the interesting piece, as their pre-development with nothing on paper yet, working with the chiefs and advising the communities and reminding them that they have to start writing about their relationship documenting these things, their trap lines, their fishing, where their medicines are, all these elements, because what's going to come into this reality is a challenge over, again, picking up where my brother left off here, is we're, we have to fight for this recognition. This isn't coming willingly, right? These concepts have been co-opted. Right? And there's a famous quote that drives me, Duncan Campbell Scott, right? We've got to solve the Indian problem. Right? This was a quote when, when they were making Indian residential schools mandatory right, in Canada in 1920. And you can read parliamentary papers of where our government clearly articulated their plan. And what is this plan? We have to really understand that when we started, when the settlers first started arriving, we started from a place of equal power. In fact, you might even say we had more power as indigenous people. As our white brothers and sisters were coming across the boats, we were saying, man, you look pretty pale. You need something to eat. But we shared. And that's where we set up those peace and friendship treaties, right? But then, questions of land title. Well, who actually owns it? Well, the crown came here and claimed it. Well, first, well, we know what happened with the Vikings, right? They came over to assert their dominance. What happened to them? They were all killed, right? All the various other crowns came. They did things differently here in North America because indigenous communities had more power. But that demand for who owns the land and the economy that's tied to the land, and we know the natural resources in Canada are absolutely the backbone of the Canadian economy. So indigenous people were starting to be seen as that problem. We're in the way, right? The problem is that we exist. We have to deal with that. So we start defining the legal terms of what constitutes even a human being, right? And through the doctrine of discovery, and, and I can't remember his name now, it just jumps out of my head, the Pope in 1493 said only Christians can hold land title, right? So everything that was done through the social political process and settlement was about extinguishing who we were, right? Until we could finally retain a lawyer in 1964, and we start making these demands for our civil rights and fighting for these things. But we're in this place of reclamation, right? We're reclaiming these things right now reclaiming our languages, our ways of knowing, and all these aspects. But although that target, that end run, was assimilation, I think what many political leaders in the Canadian nation state had no idea how stubborn we really were, how resistant we really are. The fact that there's any of us left here in Canada is truly amazing when we really see how detailed this plan of extermination really was. We look at all of these things and the human rights violations that's occurred through all of these Indian social policies, designed really to remove us from each other, 
remove us from the land, remove us from our culture, from our language, to isolate us in so many ways, to remove the sources of our power is our relationships, to attack those relationships and to remove us from those relationships. And so we came into this analysis, again, as psychologists, but understanding that we must explore power. And what is at the root of power in a capitalistic country is understanding natural resources and the governance and the rights around those elements. Because we do realize we exist in a unique place in Canada, right? And that is reality that Canada is still working on this, solving this Indian problem. If there's no more Indian problem, it means no need for treaty recognition. No question of land ownership and title. No more fiduciary financial responsibility. And no question of Canadian sovereignty. Because we still own our lands. This still largely is the intent, even though we have a more sexier talking head today in our Canadian nation state, who's co-opted all the language of self-determination and treaty building and all these nice fancy words who've taken and learned greatly from indigenous political leadership and are now trying to turn it against our people with a promise of improving indigenous crown relations. We're still in that same trajectory, but we're doing it through termination agreements. Final agreements, treaty, new treaty agreements. It's still about dealing with that basic premise that we are rights holders as sovereign nations that retain this, given and granted to us from our creator. And the state does not want to recognize our power. So when we're starting to bring this into the legal discourse, Absolutely, we have to be afraid of how it comes in. We have to be conscious of how it comes into this discourse and be careful that it's not going to be used against us. And first and foremost, we must be coming from that place of Gayashra Goa, that great law, Mino Bamatsuit. All those ongwe honwe geka, those original instructions. And as allied scholars and activists and academics, you must pay attention to the indigenous voices. You must privilege those indigenous voices. And if you're going to play this game, you must honor and respect the positioning of those indigenous communities. So I'll leave it there because my timekeeper is going to get really mad at me. <laughs>